All right. Good afternoon. Welcome to another Talking Ball live chat with Pat Leonard here at 1230. Not noon today. A few minutes late. Joey B. Comedy was in here on time. Joey, I'll try to be on time next time. Uh, you know, we had Andy Bischoff leaving the Giants. That was news I had to write up uh, for the New York Daily News and also make some phone calls on. Pushed me back a little bit here. Uh, but we're going to try to stay regular on the Talking Ball with Pat Leonard live podcast Mondays at noon, Thursdays, probably at nine o'clock in the off season. That's what we are looking at. But Super Bowl week is here. I got my Super Bowl t-shirt on, ready to go. I will be in Las Vegas from Thursday through the game, at the game at Allegiant Stadium in Vegas till Tuesday, covering the Giants, covering the NFL, covering all those things in between. Um, First, I want to tell you guys about Bet Online, and then we're going to get right rolling into your questions and into some stories I wanted to talk about related to the Super Bowl and also to the New York Giants. The big game is finally here. Bet Online is your number one source for playoff odds, stats, trends, and lines with everything from point spreads to hundreds of player performance props. With dozens of odds, props, and info on hundreds of sports, events, politics, and entertainment. You can access the world's best wagering information anytime from dis- desktop or your mobile devices. Head to Bet Online today to stay updated on all the action. Bet Online, where the game starts. Where I wanted to start, Joey B, I'm going to get to your questions. Chronicles, I'm going to get to you. Wanted to start by mentioning a couple things on my mind that maybe could get some conversation going, some Giants related, uh, but also Super Bowl related. So, Kadarius Tony. We all know Kadarius, young Joka, as he's known in the music world. Uh, He has been dramatic. There's been distractions. There was the offensive offside penalty that cost the Chiefs the game. There's been a couple dropped passes returned for touchdowns um, or one return for a touchdown by the Lions in the season opener, another costly one by the Patriots that the Patriots offense then converted. And Kadarius hasn't been playing for the Kansas City Chiefs. Not only that, but then, of course, you saw – He had uh, the incident where the Chiefs were listing him out with personal reasons and a hip injury. Kadarius goes online, essentially rips the team and says that they are lying about his injury and that he's not hurt, right? So that brings us to the week before the Super Bowl where he returns to practice as a full participant. And now his hip injury, the ankle injury, any of those things that were on the injury report are now no longer there. And that to me raises the question, if you're the Chiefs, Do you roll up to the high stakes table late at night, hit the ATM when you're down a couple thousand dollars and do you put it all on red? Do you go right up to the, to the table? You're bleeding chips. You're five drinks in there. You're you're tipping the waitress. You're doing anything to hop on trends, to get one win, just to feel like you're back in on the action. You're the chiefs. You're down in the fourth quarter. Do you go to Kadarius Tony? Do you dress him for this game? Do you roll the dice if you're Andy Reid and the Kansas City Chiefs that Kadarius can give you the shot in the arm, the bolt of lightning that he gave them in the Super Bowl last year against the Philadelphia Eagles? Because remember this, Andy Reid knew going into that game that he couldn't rely for the full game on Kadarius Tony, right? I believe Kadarius played something like six snaps on offense and two snaps on special teams in that game. And most of the snaps came in the fourth quarter when they were down and looking for someone who could just make a play. He's so talented, right? He's slippery. He's hard to tackle. He's hard to bring down. Whenever he gets the ball, there's a chance he's going to score a touchdown. And I just think a fascinating element of this Super Bowl. there's so many, obviously, top stories. Mahomes versus Purdy, Reed versus Shanahan, the legacies involved, uh, the, the San Francisco 49ers defense coming off a bad NFC championship game where they're criticizing themselves for their efforts. Steve Spagnolo, the defensive coordinator in the chiefs with those giants ties. I'll be writing about him in the daily news. But to me, I'm so intrigued by, first of all, with what Kadarius has said recently about the chiefs, does Andy Reid welcome him back into the fold and onto the game day roster? Right. And then secondly, how do you use him? Do you only use him if you're down 10 in the fourth quarter and you need a spark or Do you say, listen, we've been missing a great playmaker. And even though he's made mistakes, we feel like we need to put our confidence behind him in order to help us. I personally think based on the contributions of Rasheed Rice, of um, MVS, 
even of Richie James, a former giant, you know, a quietly reliable veteran on punt return who's seen some snaps on offense. And obviously Kelsey stepped up. I could see Kadarius dressing for the game and then being available for some critical and key moments, especially after you saw Miko Hardman fumble twice in the AFC title game. But remember, this is a Pacheco led offense. It's more conservative. We saw Patrick Mahomes get really frustrated with Tony the last time he played dropping passes against the Patriots. And it just remains to be seen whether Andy Reid is going to go with that or not. Of course, now you have the reports, Mahomes' dad um, and the uh, getting in trouble with the law again. And that could also end up being a distraction as well. Who knows? I still think going into this game, we'll talk more about this on Thursday, that Patrick Mahomes versus Brock Purdy, I think you'd be kicking yourself if you wake up Monday and the Chiefs won and you thought somehow Purdy would come out on the winning side of that. But we will see. And then a second thing I wanted to bring up is the World Cup final in 2026 landing with MetLife Stadium and the fact that we now know right off the bat that they will accommodate the World Cup and the world's greatest football players in New Jersey with real grass for that tournament. And I'll be writing this for the Daily News as well after we get off of this live chat. But this is this is time if there ever was a time for them to just go to full grass for the NFL players as well. So now we have evidence that the Giants and the Jets will do it, that when there's enough incentive, when there's the incentive of the economy and how the World Cup coming to North America, coming to the United States, coming to New Jersey, New York area, and what that's going to do, provided enough incentive, looks like they're, they're ready to go to grass for that, right? So if you're the NFL players right now, I think you have to be looking at this and say, well, what about us? Because they've been clamoring for it for a while. And you have places like Baltimore, Philadelphia, and Washington in similar climates or the same climate that are making it do with grass. All right. So Joey B, uh, like I said, first one in. Um, and Giants Chronicles. What's going on, Giants Chronicles? Guys, thanks for joining. Give me those thumbs up. Give me those likes while we do this. Hunter, what's going on? Uh, Lou Ann is here. Ken is here. Josh, Jake, what's going on? Joe as well. Thanks for joining. All right. Chronicle says, Pat, I have respect for your work and everything. And I understand the perspective you are coming from on these articles and it makes sense. However, why can't we write some positive things here? Also, is it possible the Giants respect Mike Kafka and want to keep him because they believe he is a smart young coach? It's common practice in the NFL to block lateral moves and it is not uncommon. Chronicles, I understand your frustration with hearing so many critical things. Um, I have balanced that with positives. I think uh, my story on the offensive line search at the Senior Bowl on Adams and Rosengarten is a good example of kind of digging into the personnel side and some intriguing possibilities and looking at the future. And I think there's definitely needs to be an element of coverage that is always looking towards the future as well. Um, I try to balance that. I do think that how the team is faring often dictates that, you know, so for example, if you're coming off last year, they're coming off a playoff berth and a playoff win and then getting blasted out of the playoffs. So the coverage is kind of balanced between, Hey, look at what they did and how they exceeded expectations. And here's the reasons why, then here's the reasons why they failed at the end and then projecting the positives and negatives in a critical and analytical way into the future and so Chronicles, frankly, I'll just be totally honest here. I think that I have good insight right now into the way the Giants are operating, into the way that they are struggling, into why are they why they are struggling. And so there are a lot of forces, a lot of voices out there trying to stamp down the reality of what has happened with the Giants organization, with the staff right now, with people trying to get out, trying to leave, trying to find greener pastures, right? Um, I believe they've had now nine coaches either fired or leave of their own accord or eight coaches either fired or leave of their own accord this cycle alone. Now with Andy Bischoff, the tight ends coach, going to the Chargers with Jim Harbaugh to be tight ends coach and run game coordinator. And it's been 12 total if you count the four turning over last year. That includes two. This will be the third straight year that they'll have a different running backs coach. Obviously, two coordinators gone and blocking Mike Kafka, which I'm sure I'm going to get to next with what you brought up with Mike. Blocking Mike Kafka um, is an example of a perception and optics driven decision that, and it's not, it's not just the giants who do this, but 
when you're in a position where you're taking play calling away from a guy and marginalizing a coach further on the offensive side of the ball, as is expected with Kafka this season, if he's kept in New York, compared to letting him out to go call plays in Seattle, especially given what he's dealt with in the culture and the environment that he worked under, that's just not good business. And people talk about that when that's done to people because it's not the right way to handle things. And that's what I would say about the critical stuff. As far as positive, um, you know, I think if there's a positive, it's that the Washington commanders hired Cliff Kingsbury. And um, let's be honest. I mean, he had room to grow what he did in Arizona, the way he called games offensively. I think the Dan Quinn, Cliff Kingsbury pairing in Washington, I have a lot of questions about. Um, Adam Peters is supposed to be a, a good, smart, young, up-and-coming GM. But um, I still have questions about what's happening there. Obviously, they have the number two pick and a quarterback. But, you know, if you want positives, that's what I would look at is, like, the Eagles are reeling. Um, you know, do you really feel like um, – do you really feel like their hirings have fixed their problems, right? Are their problems fixable? Um, are they going to manage games extremely well this year, bringing in the two new coordinators? Uh, Dallas Cowboys, they lose Dan Quinn. What are they doing on the defensive side of the ball? They have some roster um, spots to fill, you know. But as far as the Giants go individually, I think if you're not looking at them critically, in a way that says this isn't good enough and has to get better, then I don't think we're being honest about the assessment of where they are. So that's my answer to that. And you said, is it possible they respect Kafka and want to keep him? Well, they know he's a respected young coach, but I, as I've detailed in my reporting, he's not treated that way there. And they've already taken play calling away from him multiple times. They took the offensive meetings away from him for a month. Um, he's been marginalized there. He hasn't been treated well. And this is the thing that I, I really need to stress to you. And then we'll get to some of Joey B's questions and, and input because um, Joey B is very knowledgeable and I can't wait to get to that as well. Chronicles, you kicked us off with some great questions here and I really appreciate you doing that. Um, the, the fact of the matter is Seattle would, ne after meeting twice with Kafka for a head coaching position, Seattle never would have put a slip in for Mike if they didn't think he would take it. And if they didn't think he was looking for that, and if they didn't value him to want him to be their play caller, right? Like it's all, it's all aligned. It's not like this is a situation where um, they would request it. The giants would grant it. And Kafka would say, no, thanks. I'd rather stay with the giants. Like that's, uh, that's, you're not connecting the dots well enough. If you think that would happen. And as far as blocking it, if they were to block it and give Kafka a raise and give him autonomy with the offense, let him call it, never take it away from him, uh, talk to him and treat him better, right? All those things. Then now you're talking about a coach you value, but that's not how he's been dealt with. And that's not how it looks like he's going to be dealt with. In which case it's just a self-serving decision. They should let him out. They should really let him out. Joey B says, I think they do respect Kafka and want to keep him, but let's be honest, this whole off season has been a shit show. At this point, let him go, be happy, bring in someone that'll be happy here. Joey also says he just saw Saquon on first take and didn't like his tone on the situation. It sounds like he's out, but he backed Daniel Jones with full confidence. What did you make of that, Pat? Yeah, Joe, I, I think that's um, anyone who hasn't seen Sa Saquon's interviews on first take. I think he did Kay Adams' show. I'm hopeful to catch up with him in Vegas as well this week. Um, Saquon, here's my take on Saquon. He loves New York and loves the Giants fan base and playing for the fans and playing for the Giants. He loves that idea. He's grateful to have been drafted where he was. And his goal has always been, his goal has always been, let's win a championship. Let's win a Super Bowl with the Giants. Unfortunately, given what has happened and now that we get to this point, my take is I think Saquon wants to go play somewhere else that because not only – he doesn't want out. He just wants to be valued properly and he wants to be able to win. And I don't think either of those things can happen for him now with the Giants, with the time window that he has in order to maximize his career, both value and on-field production wise. So what I think is, I think Saquon wants to play somewhere else. I just don't think he wants to say it. So 
like he said on first take today, I want to be a giant, but unfortunately it's a business. And it, if this was my final season as a giant, you know, I, I wanted to accomplish these goals. If I have to leave and go somewhere else, then it's been good there. I still believe in DJ. I still think Daniel Jones is going to succeed and I wish him the best. Right. So Joey B, I agree with you. I think, I do think it's, I think he ends up playing somewhere else. And from a financial standpoint, I think the Giants, you know, it would be reasonable for the Giants to make him an offer, right, before they let him hit the market, if that's their plan. But the franchise tag feels like it's out automatically because that's $12 million. And with $22 million or $21 million or so right now in cap space, plus whatever they clear, which will be some, but not a ton, then the Giants committing $12 million there, uh, you know, and that number doesn't sound like something that they would do, especially with how we know Joe Shane uh, views the running back position. So I do think he ends up on a different team and been interesting to see to see um, that a couple teams that are, that are kind of lighting up social media connected to Saquon right now are the chargers and the Houston Texans. Um, you know, I see a lot of people breaking down film of how he would look in like Bobby Slowick's offense in Houston and what his fit would be there. And that, uh, I think pro football focus projected him to the Texans. And then also you have um, the Chargers with Ryan Leaf coming out, who knows Jim Harbaugh well. Ryan Leaf coming out saying that Harbaugh loves Saquon and would love to have him. So you're hearing that too. That's a much stronger push around Saquon than last year when he was really kind of playing it uh, the, the way that he – could best to keep everything in house with the giants. And he felt like he got screwed doing that. So now he's handling it differently and um, kudos to him for doing that. All right. Joey B with another one says, and guys remember, um, and I see more questions in the queue. We'll get to all of them. Thank you so much for joining me, Pat Leonard here on the talking ball live Q and a remember, if you want your question answered sooner to jump to the front of the line, you can pay for a super chat or a super sticker. It goes right to the front of the queue. I get to it immediately. It's a nice way to spice up the chat and support what we do here. And then also remember, we do these twice a week in the off season. Now we're going to go Mondays at noon, Thursdays at 9 p.m. And um, so that'll be two a week, plus whatever I do with the podcast, more offerings coming. I know I've been promising that. You'll see more coming from me um, on the YouTube page and from me in general as we go here. And remember, follow me on TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, at PL on NFL. I'm on X at P Leonard NYDN. Also on Facebook, just my name, Pat Leonard. Uh, I've been trying to build that out as well. And the Talking Ball with Pat Leonard podcast. As you know, uh, we're going to, we have a lot of uh, great guests lined up and we're going to come and in, come into the off season hot here in the next few weeks. So stay tuned. All right. Joey B also said, why aren't we letting Kafka go? They're bringing in a new coach at tons of positions. So why hold on to him if he doesn't want to be here? Yep. Perception driven optics. They know how bad it looks already with how many coaches have left and losing three coordinators with essentially knowledge that all three wanted out, um, you know, just confirms. And re really you shouldn't need confirmation of how bad it got there and how bad it is there, but that would certainly, um, throw cold water on all of their public relations efforts to smooth it over. That's for sure. Let's see. Joe says, how do we reshape the roster? Who do you think we draft or potential free agents we can bring in to really revamp the team? Um, and he's at the barber shop, So he's listening on his AirPods. Respect you, Joey. Thanks for dumping all these into the queue right off the bat. Uh, reshaping the roster, Joe, I think starts with um, first, you got to get a defensive coordinator in. And you need to know uh, what system you're going to be running, because certainly when you're going into um, free agency, you know, let alone the draft, 4-3, four, 3-4. Three, three, four. I know Joe Shane has talked about he feels like they can play either, but you need another linebacker in the middle of your defense there. Um, you, you, you need to have an understanding of the scheme that you're going to run and how guys are going to fit, right? You still want to draft the best players, but you do need to have an understanding of that. So hiring – that defensive coordinator is um, is something that needs to happen to fully answer that. Of course, it came out uh, yesterday that the Giants interviewed Durante Jones. He's the Vikings defensive backs coach. Uh, 
you know, for this vacancy. Unfortunately, just to confirm everything we've been talking about, the Giants have had a couple, uh, you know, multiple candidates turn them down and take other jobs instead to reaffirm, you know, concerns about this being a potential one and done situation for them with Brian Dable on the hot seat entering year three and Joe Shane under some pressure to make this look palatable in the, his third season as well, especially with some personnel misses. But Joey, I think fixing the quarterback situation and, you know, you have Daniel Jones in the building, but, and we'll get to this. I see some other questions about it too, but figuring out a quarterback situation that doesn't leave you, you know, threadbare at that position, whether injuries happen or guys don't play well enough. It can't just be a couple mediocre guys at the position. You got to have either a developmental angle or some promise or upside there. And uh, they need to really attack the quarterback position, in my opinion, this off season. You also have to get a number one wide receiver, which I think is the leading contender to be the pick at number six. You have to improve your offensive line. Notice I'm going essentially all offense here as far as uh, positional priorities, but you need a right tackle, you need guards, and and you definitely need another pass rusher as well. Also corner, right, is a guy like a Dory Jackson. You know, you probably don't expect him to be here. Um, You know, after this season, his contract will void a few days after the Super Bowl. So all of those things um, are something you have to attack. Not to, And we're not even forgetting or mentioning Xavier McKinney and his contract situation. Jim Osborne checks in with the $2 super chat. Thank you, Jim. I'm going to shoot right to Jim's question, Pat, not to know who's going to be calling the plays going into season three with Kafka is all on Brian Dable. This guy seems to be headed in the wrong direction because it's a recipe for mediocrity. Yeah, Jim, it, it, my best understanding is that it's this is going to result in Brian Dable calling the plays, the offensive plays this season. That's a one reason why this isn't fair for Kafka. But also, to me, it's not even fair for Dable in the sense that, like, why bring Kafka back and then, let's say, take things away from him, have him working underneath, disgruntled, right, and just kind of buried in your operation only to make it look better that he didn't get out, right? And then for Dable, like, here's one thing I'll say. Listen, last offseason, last season, He was scrambling, right, taking play calling away from Kafka at different times, giving it to Shea Tierney at one point, um, you know, calling it himself at another point. That's what he supposedly is his expertise, right? Like maybe you'd ask me, hey, if you're a media personality, Pat, um, if you had to rely on one thing you did well to save your job, what would it be? Would it be tweeting? Would it be writing? Would it be talking on TV? And maybe I'd say, you know what, I think if I got to write one good story, that would be putting my best foot forward to convince you I deserve this job rather than doing that or that. Right. So for Brian Dable, if he has his job on the line and it's like, well, Brian, if you're going to make your best case for why you deserve to have this job, what is it? Then for him, it's probably, I can fix the offense, right? That's how he got the job. So in my opinion, Brian Dable taking over play calling, like I, there's nothing wrong with that. Like you, the last thing you want to do is go into a season where you feel like your job's on the line. Let's say you lose your job and it's, you go downhill and you get fired. You never want to be sitting on the beach a week later saying, I shouldn't have listened to all these other people who told me not to take over play calling and not to do that and to delegate that to people who did it differently or who I didn't fully trust. I should have just done it myself. Right. And so in that sense, um, I, I think Brian Dable would be right to take over play calling because if that's what he does best, and that's what got him this job in the first place, what he did in Buffalo, then that's how he should either save his job or go out, is going out his way. Joel checking in with a $5 super chat says, what is your take on reports that Bill Belichick is advising other coaches to steer clear of the Giants? Joel, that's interesting. Where did you hear that? Could you share that with me? Uh, Because... Um, there's been a lot of rumors about, Hey, right. Like you and I, and everybody who roots for the giants, covers the giants, knows the NFL, everybody's looking at Belichick being a free agent and the giants with a coach on the hot seat and things going downhill and saying, should we connect these dots? Right? Like that's a, that's a pretty common thought. Um, but Belichick advising other coaches to steer clear of the giants. I had not heard that. Um, I, 
I can tell you that there's a clear reason why people are not choosing the Giants. And there's a clear reason why, reason why several coaches are choosing to leave the Giants or still want to leave the Giants, right? So maybe Belichick is hearing those same things and passing them along. But also remember, Bill Belichick is the one who recommended Joe Judge to John Mara, right? Um, now, obviously, that didn't go the way it was supposed to. That was supposed to be minimum three years, and his guy gets fired after two. But Joel, let me know where you where you've heard that. I'm curious to uh, to dig into that further. Maybe even drop the link in here in our chat. All right, let's see. That's an intriguing one, though, Joel. Okay. Thank you for that support there with the super chats and the super stickers. Okay. Joe says, what's up? What's going on, Joe? Chronicle says, Pat, what are you hearing about how the Giants are going to address the quarterback position? Did you get any nuggets at the Senior Bowl? Um, Chronicle's my best read on that is that the Giants – they want to get a young quarterback into the building to develop them for the future. Part of the problem right now is where they are picking and the fact that winning a few games at the end of the year there back them up to number six. So now you can't just obviously take the quarterback because three, three are expected to go ahead of the Giants pick. So maybe you get JJ McCarthy in the back of the first round. You know, you could trade back from six and get, Bo Nix at nine or 10 or whatever it is. But, um, you know, there's kind of, they're kind of in this middle ground, right? Because you don't want to draft a quarterback who's going to leave you in the search for your quarterback next year anyway, right? Like a mediocre young guy who it's like, well, he's in the building and he can help us on a cheaper contract, but next year we might have to draft one anyway, right? Like that's not what you want to do when you draft a quarterback anywhere in the first or second round. So, I think the Giants are looking in the in those directions in those rounds, and ideally, you'd be able to to just go get your guy. But like, and I saw um, Matt Miller put this in his mock draft from Mobile. Saw Matt down there as well. Uh, I saw Matt put in his mock draft that he's hearing a lot of rumors that the Giants are probably going to go the veteran backup route to Daniel Jones. And see, you know, I've seen people say Jacoby Brissett. I mean. It, who's better, like Tyrod Taylor or Jacoby Brissett? Um, you know, Tyrod, I don't think would want to be um, necessarily back in a situation where he could be benched consciously for Tommy DeVito again. But he uh, also, I think, takes well to New York and is a proud guy who would not be above just putting himself in his best life situation, regardless of what was happening. But definitely did not like how he was handled. He did not uh, in the second half of the season. So, I feel like that's less likely and the veteran QB market just isn't that sexy or that deep. So yeah, it could be a guy like Brissett, but frankly, I'm worried about their quarterback plan and position because if you can't get the blue chippers, um, you know, you end up in no man's land and essentially you're back where you started last year, which is like, well, we hope Daniel Jones is great. Right. So, you know, I'm a bit concerned about the plan versus the execution. Jake says, Pat, just because an OC is not calling plays does not mean they're not a value and an asset. Jake, he would be calling plays for the Seahawks if he went there versus the Giants keeping him in-house and taking play calls away and burying them on the staff to what? Like work with the quarterbacks a little bit? I mean, you're not doing you're doing a, a disservice to the person, to the individual. Right? If you if you valued him and had that much respect for him, you'd be having him call your plays. Right? Joe says, any info on possible free agent signings? Um, I know just, just connecting the dots, like Justin Hardy from the Jets seems like a guy who could be a fit based on his health with uh, Gobriel, their special teams coordinator, jumping in from the Jets. You know, you always have um, – you always have guys um, – like when Joe Judge came to New New York from New England, for example, like Nate Ebner was a free agent then. And um, instead of him re-signing in New England, like Ebner came with Judge to New York to try to help him build stuff, you know, whatever, be a conduit to the locker room, have some consistency, somebody he could lean on, that kind of thing. 
Um, so I think, you know, if you look at like the Jets um, free agent situation, what their roster looks like, special teamers who were valuable to them and who are available now, and Gobriel coming to New York trying to make some some hay here, like Justin Hardy, obviously a captain with the Jets. So if he if he's healthy um, and can be healthy, could be an asset in the locker room as well as on the field when healthy. And um, Ashton Davis, actually, from the Jets is another name um, who's an interesting one, uh, you know, to look at from a standpoint of somebody who could contribute on special teams for the Giants has some uh, consistency with the former Jets assistant special teams coordinator. Also, Jermaine Elamanor makes a lot of sense to me as a um, as an attempt at a reasonable free agent ad at right tackle a position the Giants can't just leave to chance. I know Matt Miller, I saw, had a projected this early second round pick to the Giants as a guard, to a guard out of Duke who has played tackle but could play guard in the pros and also swing back to tackle if needed. I'm not sure just having a contingency plan to Evan Neal is the right call. I think you want to go get someone who can start for you at that position. Um, so that's another one I think to keep an eye on um as we go all right let's see ken says they may want to hang on to kafka as a possible replacement for dable i mean if dable were to if dable were to get fired mid-season this year then the team is likely bad enough that handing it over to kafka isn't doing him any favors um but certainly if he stays he could be in a position possibly to take over if that were the case. Um, but again, if you had a lot of respect for this guy and you were grooming him to possibly be your next head coach, you don't take play calling away from him and have him working essentially in the background and not doing anything meaningful related to the game day operation. But that's just not how it works if you have high hopes for somebody. Josh says, how much of a mess do you think this is actually Dable just being a bad guy versus him trying to keep a season that was falling apart together? Um, Josh, this is this is a case of a lot of people not wanting to work here anymore because of how last season went. Best way I can put it. Luann, what's up, Luann? The eternal optimist is back. Luann always keeps the vibes up here. So Chronicles, if you're looking for positivity, it is always Luann. It is always Luann. Luann, thanks for jumping in here. Jake says, can you describe the role of a pass or run game coordinator? Is having that title a big deal? And do the Giants have anyone with that title? The Giants do not have anyone with that title right now. Jake, a lot of times what that has, what that usually has to do with is the teams lay out at the beginning of the week, the way they envision, like from the head coach's standpoint, a way they envision attacking um, the team they're about to play, right? So let's just say you're on offense doing pass game coordination and run game coordination. So I let's say I'm Kyle Shanahan, right? And I call the plays and I have an idea of how I want to attack it. And I say this, I see their defense. This is how this is how I want to attack it. This is who I want to get the ball to. This is where I want to hit them. This is the mismatches I see. Pass game and run game coordinator, their role is to marry the overall game plan into their concepts so that the run and pass both work off of each other and complement each other well in that specific scheme, game plan, and accounting for who's going to be in the game on both sides of the ball, accounting for who's going to be healthy and in the lineup, who's not, and making sure that your game plan is airtight so that you're not just calling plays like you're pointing at a bingo board, right? It's more like the idea of meshing the concepts from pass to run and creating this kind of umbrella concept of here's how our pass game looks because this is how we want the overall game plan to look. Here's how our run game looks because this is how our overall run plan for this game looks. And here is how they marry together in that game plan so that they complement our overall strategy, offensive, defense, and special teams to, uh, to execute it from start to finish. And so I know that sounds like generic and open, but remember, like they're, they're already position coaches and coordinators working on the X's and O's of here's how we attack this play. Here's how we coach this technique. 
we have to get better here. We have to get this guy healthy. So there's all these moving parts. So that's like a bigger umbrella, bigger picture role of ensuring that everything fits inside this sound scheme. I hope that it makes a lot of sense. If it doesn't, let me know. I'll try to explain that a little bit better. Um, Luann says, I hope the Niners kick butt. Luann, I have a hard time believing that Patrick Mahomes is going to lose to Brock Purdy, but I could be wrong. Um, Hunter, what's going on, man? Luann says, if I recall, the Giants had grass and changed it back a few times. Yeah, they went to that tray system, didn't work out, but it's happened, um, you know, with a lot of these stadiums in a similar climate. Doesn't seem like me. There's any reason for it not to be, especially when it comes to player safety. If that's the priority, you got to make it happen. Hunter says, what did you think of Dylan Lobb out of UNH? Yeah, Hunter, you told me about him. I liked him. Uh, Dylan Lobb out of uh, University of New Hampshire. Um, that was a name on the tip of a lot of people's tongue at the Senior Bowl. Had a good week. Um, you know, I think definitely seems like the kind of guy who will end up going late to some team who gets the most out of him, right? Um, you know, like the almost like the Danny Woodhead mold type deal. Um, I mentioned this on our last live, but the kid out of USC, um, the running back out of USC, I thought caught a lot of people's eye, caught my eye, I think is a player uh, to watch with the Giants as well. Um, Marshawn Lloyd, I think is his name. And, um, you know, he had a really good week Can catch the ball out of the backfield. And to your point, Hunter, Dylan Lobb can too. He returns punts. Uh, so he's a returner. He showed good hands, good route running. So definitely a lot to like there. And thank you for turning me on to him as a prospect in these live chats. You're, you're bringing, you're bringing me the knowledge, you know? All right, let's see. Jake says, how much flexibility do the Giants have in free agency? Um, they have a little over 20 million in cap space and then some, some players that they can cut and move around to free some space. Um, I do think there's a good chance that Dory Jackson's not on the team because his contract will void, um, you know, unless they can get him back on the cheap. But to me, I think you're probably going with some bigger corners who more fit what you do. Um, so, but you're, they don't have unlimited money to spend. They're kind of middle of the pack when it comes to the, comes to the league so they can make one or two significantly targeted moves or signings and then the rest of it has to kind of like be creatively worked around but now remember this too um jake you can create a little bit more flexibility by pushing money out into the future right on contracts with void years things of that nature like a sean robinson has like three void years on the end of his contract from what he signed last year and when you do that is a lot of times is when it's like, listen, we got to go for broke now. We got to make sure this happens now. We're on bar. We, you know, we can't be sitting in here in October and thinking about deadline deals to improve when our season's sliding and suddenly we don't even have a job. And so this could be an off, an off season with the Giants even because Joe, Joe Shane, remember, he came in the first year and it was like, I'm done with all this kicking money down the road. I'm not using that tactic. It's been done here. It's put the Giants in a huge hole. We're not doing that, right? And then this year, he started doing it a little bit, recognizing where he had to, recognizing, ah, you know what? It's kind of a necessary evil. Even some of the new contracts that guys signed, what was it? I think Daniel and Okereke maybe, like signed contracts. And then a couple months later, they're kind of restructuring them to create more space. So you could see more of that as well to create more flexibility, because of how, uh, because of what the stakes are here for Dable, but you know, maybe even also for Shane in a sense of like the pressure to make this look like a competent offense and team, because really like what we saw last year was um, it was malpractice in some ways when it comes to building a roster and, and running a team. Brian Boyle, welcome back. Um, Joel, I saw your question there. You dropped it down there with the super chat. Appreciate it. Brian Boyle says, keep telling it as you see it, Pat. Your insights are always are most always spot on. Thank you, Brian. I appreciate it. Guys, listen, I really wish this team would just turn it around. It would be more, it would be more um positive and intriguing. But listen, like I, you know, to Chronicles' point about, hey, why is it all so negative? I mean, I was singing praises at one point in the season when they were winning a couple games here and there. Obviously, Bobby O'Karake singing his praises, pointing out when Mike McFadden was playing well pointing out when Jalen Hyatt uh, you know, burst out for his 100-yard game against the Patriots, 
when Wandale Robinson finally started becoming a difference maker. Um, there are definitely spots and elements like Kayvon Thibodeau getting to his 11 and a half sacks and getting there pretty quickly in the season. There's a lot of, a lot of positives that we want to point out. Um, so yeah, just trying to tell it like it is. How come it is an issue when the Giants block Kafka, but no one was mad when some DC candidates were blocked? Thor says. Uh, Thor, thank you for the super chat. $5 checking in. Really appreciate you, man, supporting the channel. Um, you talking about when DC candidates were blocked, like that the Giants were trying to interview? Well, so it all depends on how things go in certain situations. And obviously, I'll be honest with you, Thor. Sometimes reporters just don't get to the things that I got to this year. Like, and that's, I'm not even, I'm not trying to toot my own whore there. I'm just, I'm saying like, I, this is part of the reason why I think I can bring value. And I think why we are here talking right now like this is because you guys know, like I can get to some of this information and some of these things that people aren't getting to consistently on your favorite team. And you want them to be positive things too. Remember, I told you last August that Justin Pugh was a guy to watch for the Giants and that he was watching them and that they were watching him and that it probably wasn't going to happen right away, but it might happen eventually. And then what happened? He signs in October and he helps kind of patchwork some things on the offensive line to make them a little bit, you know, to make them competent in the second half of the season, even though games were up and down. But like I brought that to you right away, right? So Thor, my best answer there is, okay, great example, is Euro Evero from the Carolina Panthers, a guy who there were rumors he wanted out of Carolina, right? And he interviewed for certain head coaching positions, didn't get a job, a head coaching job. And then, um, you know, there were rumors that maybe he would love to be to be somewhere else as a defensive coordinator just because he didn't have the pre-existing relationships or strong ties that made it obvious that he would just stick on with uh, Morgan and Canales there. And yet he is returning. Now, throughout that process, nobody reported on his definite strong feelings that he didn't want to be in Carolina, that there was something, you know, majorly sour there specifically between him and Canales and those types of things. But remember, there was the bombshell reporting about how toxic it had gotten inside that building, inside that organization from the owner on down, David Tepper on down. Um, and so there were, you know, there was kind of, uh, there was noise and, uh, and ugliness around some of what was going on there in Carolina too. So that was critical. Um, and the DC coordinator candidates, I mean, with the giants specifically, really what more has been happening there is more than guys getting blocked. It's been, guys choosing other teams, right? Choosing the Titans, um, you know, popular names, just following their head coaches somewhere else rather than, um, you know, rather than entertaining the Giants job, which you would think as the New York Giants defensive coordinator position would be iconic. It would be something people would be, um, you know, maybe more interested in. But really the reality, Thor, is just people understand that this is a, this is not looking like a great situation here. Um, and so they're skeptical. Good, great question. And thank you for the support. And if, again, guys, like if I, if I don't answer it properly, or there's something I thought I answered it, but I like overlook some part of your question, just throw, throw back in a clarification, you know, um, CGF says what percent of the time last season, do you think Dable was calling the offensive plays? I feel that he was calling the plays more than reported. Good job as always. Um, I definitely know of at least well, so when I when I wrote in my story that he had taken over play calling multiple times, um, and then he gave it to you know he took he gave it to Shea one time in Dallas. I know for a fact there was at least one. I believe my if talking to different people that you I heard different numbers on that. Like there were some people, just to be honest, who said that he took play calling away from Mike, you know. Uh, three or four times, like for himself. And there were other people who said Dable only really took it away from him once or twice for himself and then once for Tierney, right? And then there were some people who said he only took it away twice. So 
I just said multiple in this story because the reality of my reporting was there were some people who were saying it happened four or five times. There were some saying that it happened three. There were some saying that happened two. But the consensus among all my sources was that at least two times, really, honestly, like, you know, three or four seemed pretty strong. But at least two different times he took it away from Kafka, in addition to taking the offensive meetings away um, from him for a month as well for a four week stretch. Right. And so my belief based on all those conversations is that it was taken away from Kafka about four times or so. Uh, But, you know, my reporting in that story, just to give you a little bit of how the sausage is made. It's like if I if I'm not going to nail down definitively that it was five times, right? And I know for a fact it's two, and I think it's three or four, and it might be five. I can't report that it might be five. You know, I have to say multiple times it's at least two, right? That kind of thing. So I think it was more than that, but that was what I could nail down to the floor, if that makes sense. Uh, let's see. Thank you for that super chat. Really sincerely, CGF. And CGF, I see you supporting me um, on X often as well. I really appreciate that. I appreciate authentic report uh, supporting me on X big time and on social media. And I know all you guys do as well. Um, you know, just, just calling people out who have been supporting me lately uh, big time. Really do appreciate it. And um, remember, guys, if... If you haven't already, hit the like button while we are live, like hit the thumbs up button while we are live. That really helps me and us. YouTube will push that out in the algorithm. Like that's a way for it to encourage engagement with Giants fans and with NFL fans on YouTube. You got it, CGF. Um, And to really bring people back. So while we are live, hit those thumbs up. So whether you do a super chat and a super sticker or you're just giving me a like, it's all a great way to help me build this community and help us build this community that we have going here, talking Giants and talking NFL. And remember, guys, you have Super Bowl questions, you have NFL questions, you can dump them in here as well. But obviously, we're going hard on the Giants, um, you know, which I am on every day. All right, let's see. Just need to take a swig of water here because I'm getting a little parched. All right, here we go. Let's get back to it. Luann says, you cannot win championships by constantly changing coaches and players. The team needs to stay together. That's how we won Super Bowls, for sure. Just a question right now of whether this is the right group leading the way. Unfortunately, we're already in year three. It's not looking good. CGF says, what a mess. Can't think of a Giants offseason where things have gone sideways this quick. quickly. It's not even the Super Bowl yet. Indeed. If Kafka was as bad as people think he is, why would the Giants block his move? I think Kafka is cover for Dable. I think he is cover for Dable and the Giants as well. All right. Um you know, listen, Kafka is respected in the league. That's why he's getting these head coaching interviews. Can you imagine after, like, think about how bad the Giants offense was this year. And this guy's getting an two head coaching interviews with the Seattle Seahawks, plus an overture for them to basically hire him as their OC. So obviously they think more of him than the Giants were treating him this year. Joey B says, Pat, you know, I'm a huge fan of yours. And I find myself literally defending you from other fans who say all you do is tabloid takes and drama. All the things I've heard you say have come true. Joey, thank you for saying that, man. Yeah, listen, it's it's like if people want a if people want an airbrush, airbrushed version of reality, you can go find that somewhere else. It's not going to be here. And it's not because I have any axe to grind against anybody. It's just like, for example, is me getting to information whether it's good or bad for the Giants or about the Giants. Me getting to that information is my job. And so, you know, the idea that uh, I'm looking for a certain type of information or that I um, shouldn't be looking for a certain type of information is crazy. Like, it's the job. Let's see. 
Uh, Jake says, sorry, Pat, you can't just promise a guy you won't take play calling away. Give him the chance, but if the results are not there, changes need to be made. <clears throat> right. No, well, Jake, what I'm saying, though, is like, if the results aren't there and you make and you're second guessing him constantly and it's a hostile work environment and you're not throwing any confidence behind him, then why are you keeping him behind the scenes? You either have confidence in what he does or you don't. And if he wants out, just let him out. If another team has confidence in him, it's going to give him a shot to call plays. Joey B says, you said they would trade Tony before they did. And everyone clapped back at you for that take, but you were right. And that's one of many. That's right. And honestly, I think I was pretty nice about not clapping back at people when he got traded. Right which could be easy to do, but it's my job. It's my job. Joey, you're one of the bit most uh, supportive people here too. I really appreciate you. Hunter, what's going on, Hunter? A day oneer, Hunter. I imagine Washington would try to get the first pick to pair Caleb with Cliff from the UFC connection. That's possible, but then the Bears would still take a quarterback at number two. That would just be the Bears like saying, hey, yeah, we like Drake May. We're going to get a ton too, right? So that could happen, but that won't result – Washington moving up. I agree with you. That could happen. Washington moving up will not um, will not uh, push a quarterback down to the Giants. But I agree with you, especially because if you remember, and I know this is probably part of the reason you're saying it, but you know, Cliff, when he came into the league, he and Kyler Murray ended up with the same agent. And it was like a recruiting tool to get Kyler um, to Arizona, his hiring as head coach and all of that, right? And I remember Eric Burkhardt, the agent, was saying from an early point, like, you know, like Kyler Murray is going to be the first overall pick. And sure enough, there it was. So I don't think you can discount that. That's for sure. Jake says, pretty easy to figure out what teams will be players for Saquon. Point out all the poorly run teams, and they most likely will. run. Well-run teams won't pay premium money for a running back at his age. Well, Jake, the other thing is this. I, I know what you're saying about, like, how to invest in a running back. I understand that. But remember – when they like when the Giants drafted Saquon, right? The idea was that they thought, let's make one more run with Eli. And Dave Gettleman's like, let's pair him with this excellent rookie running back who can ignite the offense and turn us into this team that is ready to go. We just need another piece or two, right? Obviously, that was a huge misjudgment. Thank you for all the likes. I see you guys liking right now as we're talking. But so, Jake. A team that feels like it is ready to compete can invest in a piece like that as a luxury item, right? Now, is it smart to invest in a running back when you can find one in the fourth round or, you know, an Alvin Kamara in the third or whatever? Like, obviously, you can make an easy argument. A lot of teams do that it's just not worth it. Like, the Giants clearly feel that way about running backs. But, you know, if you're the Chargers and Jim Harbaugh and Harbaugh feels like he has a pretty good. I'm not saying they do have that team yet. I'm just saying if like the Texans, for example, where they stand in their roster, or if Harbaugh feels like the Chargers are there, or if the Chiefs wanted to take a run at Saquon as a luxury item to add to their offense, like those are places where if they invest in the guy, you don't say what a stupid move. You say, wow, this team was really good. Now you add Saquon, right? So that's where I see that. That's where I see that. Similar to what happened with McCaffrey, right? Now he was an injury, he was injury prone. He was a guy who was banged up a lot in Carolina. But what happens? He gets traded to a team that's already good that he puts over the top, right? So that's that's what I think the ideal scenario is for like a quote unquote smart investment for Saquon. Jim says, Pat, not to know who's going to be calling the plays. Oh, yeah. Okay. I, right. I already saw that and and we answered that. Thank you for the super chat, Jim. Uh Jake said, Are there any in DC interviews you think that happened? that have not been reported. Yes. Um, I will say, I can't say any like off the record stuff, but I could tell you from the beginning, this was going to be like an exhaustive search of asking, of talking to a, a ton of people. Um, now, you know, that sounds great that you're going to do your due diligence until you can't get anybody in the building to, as a hiring because they're choosing other places. Right. Um, and you're clearly now on, like, we're, at, we're at the stage of, if any of you are married, if you ever, if you ever gotten, you ever had, you know, been invited to a friend's wedding late, or you have your own wedding and you set the number and you invite 250 people to a, a wedding that's supposed to have 170. And let's say you get a few more, 
declines and turns out it's going to be 150 instead of 170. And now you, you get, you kind of send out the second wave, right? Like that's sometimes you get a, you get a late invitation. Unfortunately, sometimes that's what's happening. You're getting the second wave, right? Um, that's where the giants are right now in their defensive coordinator search. They're, they're sending out late wedding invitations to try to fill their tables. Antonio, my man, what's up? I know you've been here for a while. Sorry, it took me a long time to get down in the queue, but I appreciate you. Um, and I see all you guys down in the bottom. I will get to everyone here, even though we've been going for 55 minutes already. I love it. I love it. I love doing these guys. I love doing these. And I, listen, I'm going to, I'm going to keep building out this, you know, this, uh, this technology and how we do this. Maybe have some times where uh, I can do some co live collaborations with people on camera um, and, and things like that. All right, let's see. No Mets, no Jets, no Jets. That's <laughs> no Mets, no Nets, no Jets. I like that name. Why not let a new defensive coordinator bring in his own staff? Again, perception. Like, you know, all these guys, if all these guys try to leave, if everybody leaves your building, like, what's going to happen? Like Joe Shane and Brian Dable are going to stay while the entire staff underneath Dable leaves? Like, you know, what are we doing? While Bill Belichick sits there in the wind? I mean, you can make an easy argument and, you know, I may be close to it, right? But you can make an easy argument, like where the Giants stand right now in their situation, like Bill Belichick's in there as a free agent. What are you waiting for? Right. Antonio says the outside linebacker coach opening will most likely be filled once as a new DC, right? Yeah. Any of them, that any of the firings that happen, those will be filled eventually. Uh, but Authentic's report what, about Denard Wilson was just pointing out that one of the reasons that he felt unsettled was he was inheriting guys that he didn't really have a history with where he was kind of being like, he didn't have the freedom to build his entire own defensive staff. You know, you have Jerome Henderson, Dre Patterson, all that. Um, Antonio says you can still benefit from being an offensive coordinator without calling plays. Brian Callahan got a head coaching job for the Titans coming from the Bengals uh, where Zach Taylor called the plays. Brian Callahan also is the son of a longtime NFL coach. Um, he also, um, it took him, took him a little bit there, right. Being in Cincinnati. And also he did not have a history of being browbeaten by his head coach in Cincinnati. Like it's not, it's not the same thing, but I feel, uh, but I hear you. Um, Jake says no credible reporter has reported that about Belichick. Okay. Um, Doug says, I believe Ron talked about Belichick in one of his podcasts he said Belichick didn't like the current state of the Giants and the way it's run. Yes, I did hear that from Jordan. Um, I've also reported something similar, not as strong as what Jordan said, but just essentially that Belichick would, if he came to the Giants, like he would want to change more about the Giants than they would want to change about themselves, right? Personnel, et cetera. Um, and so that's part of the reason I'm skeptical of whether that would ever happen. But I think at the moment right now, it seems like the obvious next move from whatever's not working here. I mean, you know, I'm not reporting anything. I'm just saying like, does, doesn't it? Right. Um, but Jordan's report was interesting, pointing out that he mentioned the names Tim McDonald and John Mara as far as um, people running, helping to run the team now where the where Belichick feels like the team is different than it was when Wellington Mara was alive, which I thought was very interesting. But also, like we talked about earlier, remember, you know, Belichick, like he was re recommending Joe Judge, you know, Patricia McDaniels when the Giants were pursuing those guys. Uh, Brian Dable, obviously, he ends up texting, allegedly texting the wrong Brian, um, as we found out from the lawsuit. So, you know. All right, let's see. Hunter says, why can't Kafka, quote, quit like Wink did and just take the Seahawks job? He could, Hunter. Um he could do that. He is a, I think maybe some of that has to do with just where he is in his career. Like he's 36 years old, um, just trying to get his career off the ground. Um, if you've noticed ever since Wink Martindale, you know, walked out of the building or stormed out of the building, um, there have been a lot of voices and reports out there smearing um, the Wilkins brothers, smearing Martindale. And for Kafka, if he were to walk out and have the Giants smear him on the way out to make themselves look better, 
that could be a career killer for a young coach whose career is just barely getting off the ground. Whereas Martindale, you know, is probably as a veteran, older head coach, or not head coach, as an older veteran coach is in a position where, you know, he's been in the league for X many years. He knows what he wants, what he doesn't, where he can thrive, where he won't. And um, is just, you know, more comfortable in his conviction to, to storm out probably than a young guy who wants out, but doesn't want to be labeled as anything and doesn't want to look like, uh, doesn't want to be painted as um, a malcontent. Because obviously you guys know, like from my reporting, even though a lot, even though all these problems have stemmed from the way the giants have run things and Dable, when it comes down to it, like there's a public narrative out there that has been spread that Wink Martindale and Drew Wilkins and Kevin Wilkins are the problem, right? Um, you know, they were such a problem that Andy Bischoff wanted to go to the Chargers, right? Like, what are we talking about here? Um, so, you know, that's the that's the risk that a guy like Mike Kafka might run by doing something like that. The Newton says no chance they go veteran quarterback route and risk their jobs on that. 25 doesn't have quarterbacks worth bothering with either. Yeah, I agree, Newton. They're just in this awkward middle ground, so it's 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 kind of a, it's kind of a worrisome um, situation they're in. They really need to figure it out. Um, I, I'm going to keep doing work on JJ McCarthy. That's a name that keeps kind of popping into my ears. Also, continue to hear. I know you've seen this elsewhere that a lot of people like Bo Nix better than uh, than like a lot of people in the league like Bo Nix better than people outside do. Um, I don't know. Wasn't impressed what I saw at the Senior Bowl, but apparently interviews well and uh, is well regarded is mobile. Joey B says, what do you think of this Kyler Murray swap for DJ rumor? And what's the chances we trade up to get those blue chip QBs? Um, well, we know Joe Shane wouldn't mind Kyler because he drafted Juan Dale, right? So, um, you know, short and quick, he doesn't have a problem with that. Um, where did you hear that rumor though? Uh, Joey B, where's that coming from? So Joel said that the Belichick report came from Giants wire Dan, Dan Belton, but Joey B, tell me where you heard that. I'll get back to it. Uh, Doug says if Dable takes over play calling, do you expect Kafka to stay up in the booth and any changes or improvements to the game management analytics process? There definitely has to be changes and improvements to game management and analytics. Um, I think it has to become more advanced. I don't know how it's going to happen but they certainly need to be better at managing the game. And an interesting part of it is like Joe Shane, there's no doubt Joe Shane, like if you asked him if he thought D Dable did a good, good job managing games as the head coach in critical spots, I think if you gave him truth serum, he would have to say no. Uh, so I think that that's, that's as much of a shame thing too, the game management analytics process as well as a Dable thing. I, they definitely have to work on that. Kafka staying up in the booth. Let's see if he stay, if he's on the staff. Um, if he is and Dable takes over play calling, I would imagine he'd be, you know, marginalized and and um, and up in the booth. Although maybe at that point, just as a way to do something else and do something new and different, you know, he ends up on the sideline. But I know he likes being up in the booth. That's what he always says. Joey says, I know you have to be PC, but I don't. It sounds like Dable is a dick. And if if that's so. Why won't Shane just ax him and bring in Belichick? Why keep him if everyone else hates it there because of him? Well, remember, Joe, this is Joe Shane's operation too. So a lot of what's gone wrong here is on is on his watch. It's not just Dable, but that's important here to, to distinguish. I know a lot of this has gets put, put on Dable, but it's not just him. Like they're a package deal. Joe Shane has, runs this program. It is his ship. And so you can't run from that. Um, I do think, Joey, when push comes to shove, that – that could end up happening, you know, Joe Shane moving on and essentially like protecting himself and getting to hire another head coach and trying to make it a longer rebuild. Um, and, but, you know, use the time that he feels was promised him when he got hired, but also remember, you know, that Joe judge got promised three years and fired after two. If Joe Shane thinks he has four to six years, it doesn't mean he won't get fired after three. Um, but I definitely think, Joey, if there's someone to go next, it would be the coach and the GM staying as we sit here right now, if things continue to go south. But we will see. My phone's blowing up right now. What's going on here? Let's see. Um, I 
Okay, no breaking news. Sorry about that. Um, all right, let's see. CGF says someone needs to ask Dable why he abandoned what work in 22, a exception of the second half of the Arizona game. He didn't stick with RPO play action concepts that Jones flourishes in. CGF, very good, very good point. Um, also, like just in general in the NFL, I felt like teams didn't run the ball as much as they did last year. Some of the stats do back that up as far as like run success and rush rate. Um, last year, we definitely saw the NFL move back to running the ball more and just you know, more undersized defenses struggling with it. And so teams like the Giants, along with many others, I think just shouldn't have gotten away from it. CGF, they definitely, I think, had this idea of we used the, this run-heavy offense to get where we needed to the year before, but now we need to improve the line, improve the pass game, and build us ourselves into a modern offense. And they just weren't ready for it in any way, ability-wise, personnel-wise, scheme-wise, game management-wise, right? So CGF, I think that's an excellent, excellent, excellent football point you make right there. Excellent point. Um, that's actually a that's actually a worthwhile note to take down because that's something that I've been talking to some people about. But um, you know, RPO play action, less of it. Why change? I think that's worth. I think that's worth a story, if not a series. Frankly, I think that's a great point. CGF, you know, a, a MVP candidate for the chat. All right, let's see. Um, Jake says, do you think Darren Waller will be back? I do think it's interesting that Waller, part of the appeal of him coming to New York, I mean, he got traded here, but one of the interesting things about him getting traded to New York was that he and Bischoff had a history of working together and now Bischoff leaves, right? Um I mean, Waller, they, like, remember, they restructured his contract um, right now. Like, if you cut him, you're eating $7 million in dead money this year. You're eating $4 million next year, $2 million the year after that. Uh, you're not going to be able to trade the guy. So if you're moving on from Waller, you're eating, you know, $7.3 million um, this year. I mean, it's, I think it's worth trying to get something out of Waller and see if he can get healthy, but obviously not a good start. CGF says, if you watch the all 22, you can see clearly Dable was trying to force what he wanted, not what worked. Interesting point. Interesting point. Very perceptive. Hunter says, do you think we will make a push for T Higgins or Michael Pittman if they don't get tagged? Find it hard to believe that, that Indianapolis would let Pittman out especially with Shane Steichen, an offensive coach, a young quarterback and Richardson that you need to build with. Like that wouldn't make any sense to me. And then T Higgins, that's, you know, that's one to watch. Um, you know, they do have like, they've invested in Hyatt. They have Slayton still under contract. Uh, would they draft a receiver high and go sign a guy like Higgins? I wouldn't hate it. Um, can only have so many receivers, but, you know, I guess Higgins is one to watch. Both of those players, though, to me, look like guys that their teams would not let out. But I know the Bengals have some tough decisions to make. Jake says, what about Chris Tabor? Giants request an interview for special teams coordinator. He got declined, and then he gets fired after the Giants hire Gobriel. Yeah, that was interesting. My understanding there, Jake, was that um, the owner in Carolina – had something invested in trying to keep the special teams coordinator around. But then as far as the new staff coming in was concerned, he was not a part of their plan. And then they ended up making it work. So that was like an owner initially wanting a guy and then, and then eventually them saying, you know, no, this, that's not going to work. And him giving it Hunter says, it's sad. This situation is all happening. We have some nice players for a defensive coordinator to build with Dax, Okereke, Bags, Kayvon, possibly Xavier. Good point, Hunter. Yeah, it is a shame it didn't work. And and Wink is a good coach, too. Like, let's be honest. Um, Hunter says, final Super Bowl prediction. Hunter, I'll give you guys a score on Thursday. But I, right now, I'll say I think the Chiefs win the game. But on Thursday in our 9 p.m. live chat, um, when we talk about more that's happened through the week, maybe we'll have a defensive coordinator hire by then. Who the heck knows? Maybe Kafka will be let out by then. Who knows? Uh, but uh, we're definitely going to 
we can definitely, uh, I'll definitely get you an exact score and a pinpoint uh, prediction on stats and how I think the game's going to play out. I'm a fan says smash the like for Pat. I appreciate it. Smash those likes. If you want your comments or, um, or questions or opinions elevated to the top of our chat, super chat, super stickers, you can pay to elevate it. You've seen a bunch of our most loyal followers pump them into the chat today. Really appreciate you guys for doing that. We'll give you shout outs at the end again. Um, remember, follow me on TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, at PL on NFL. I'm on X at P Leonard NYDN on the New York Daily News website, nydailynews.com backslash sports and the Talking Ball with Pat Leonard podcast on the Believe Network. Have a lot lined up and coming there. All right. CGF says, being a Giants content creator, I can tell you there is a click. All right. Um, that was definitely in reference to something I was talking about earlier, CGF, but probably how you do good work. Uh, Josh says, when is the next time we are expected to hear from Dable? I'm sure he will be asked repeated questions about staffing issues that happen. Do you expect him to deflect or take ownership of it? Um, I think deflect and say that uh, that's in the past and he's moving on and he did everything in the best interest of the Giants and not fully address. Um, and next time we are expected to talk to Dable would, would be likely at the NFL Combine later this month. Jake says, just curious if you ever miss being on the Rangers beat and if you keep up with them. I do miss it. I loved traveling with the team. I love going to all those, all those different cities, all those Canadian cities. Um, and I love watching live hockey. I mean, is there anything better than live hockey? There's not many things better than live hockey if there are. Um, but um, yeah, no, there's times I miss it, but I do love covering the NFL and the Giants. And, and listen, when you're younger and you have less responsibility in your life, it's easier to cover 82 game season. I once covered when they, in 2014, when they went to the Stanley cup and played the Kings, I believe I covered like 122 or 123 Ranger games that season. And so, you know, as you, as you get older and you have more responsibilities, um, it becomes a little bit more difficult, uh, to, to handle that kind of, that kind of schedule. And that's why uh, kudos to these guys and uh, these men and women who cover, you know, baseball, basketball, hockey, especially once you, you start getting up there in age. I mean, these, this is a grind, man. This is a grind when you do that. So football is known as the cushy job in the sports industry as if you're a sports writer. Um, Michael says, what's up? What's going on, Michael? Thanks for coming back, man. Taste Buds says, let's go. I just subbed. Yes, Taste Buds. Thank you. I can't tell you enough how much it means when, when we are live specifically and if you sub when you when we're live or you hit the like button when we're live, those things mean a lot for the analytics, for how it shares my page around, for how it recommends my page to people. Um, that that makes a huge difference. Thank you very much, Taste Buds. Jim says, Pat, you are an honest, accurate reporter, and we really respect you and appreciate the opportunity to speak with you. Keep doing the great work. Keep up the great work. Thank you, Jim. Doug says, will you have any draft coverage with Tony Pauline similar to last year? Those conversations were super informational. Yes, yes. Uh, Emery Hunt was excellent when he was on my podcast last year leading up to the draft. Tony Pauline was excellent. Greg Cosell was excellent. We're going to do a lot of that. Hunter says, I've seen a theory that top paid running backs don't win Super Bowls. CMC could be one that does. I haven't done too much research on that. Um well, yeah, I mean, you think about it like the, when the Patriots are winning those Super Bowls. Now, the funny thing about the Patriots is like when they would win some of those Super Bowls, they weren't high paid running backs, but like a handful of them were like first round picks. So sometimes you have like Sony Michelle, um, you know, uh, oh, what was the other guy? Was it Lawrence Maroney? Um, you know, various examples. of, But then you have like Pacheco last year, like last year in the Super Bowl. You had Miles Sanders and Isaiah Pacheco as like the two teams in the Super Bowl starting running backs, right? One guy's a seventh round pick. I think one guy was a second um, or, you know, mid rounder. And so um, you're right. No, it's, and even it's interesting, even number one wide receivers don't, don't win the way you think they would, even though they obviously translate often into some of the top offenses in the league, but guys who get paid crazy money at number one wide receiver 
um, don't often end up hold, holding the Lombardi trophy up as, as often as you would expect. If Jerome Henderson was the guy, do you think it would have been done already? Says Jake. Yeah. I mean, if he was their priority, yes, it's possible. That's the fallback, but um, I think everybody understands at this point with how they've been scouring the earth for somebody else. Why, you know, that's not, that's not uh that hasn't been their priority. Right. With Jerome, even though Jerome's a very good coach, I don't see any good reason to cut Waller says Hunter. Yeah. It doesn't seem like it based on the financials of it either. Um, but I mean, certainly, certainly you can't be optimistic about him staying healthy at this point, but based on what they invested and what they restructured, um, Zerline has the Patriots skipping Drake May and him and dropping to five in his mock draft with an Atlanta trade. And he said on the move, the sticks pod that he heard at the senior bowl that May could drop Breer now on NBC also saying Pat Patriots could trade to interesting development. If that's possible, then maybe one of those quarterbacks falls to the giants. If Drake May fell to the giants, I mean, I would think he'd be their pick. That would be my early thought on that. There is a possibility the Patriots are like they're the wild card there. Washington and Chicago are quarterback. Everybody thinks the Patriots are going quarterback, but they're a little bit of a wild card um, in people's minds. Also, quarterback value could be something there as well. Like a, a team like the Patriots thinking, well, let's get Bo Nix at nine, trade back and get him at nine or 10 or 11 rather than, you know, using our number three pick on a guy we don't think is worth it. But I also like, I think, I think Drake may and Caleb Williams are one too. That's what I think at the moment. Uh, Let's see. Thank you for that. Newton Hunter says, if not Pittman or Higgins, who could be a free agent wide receiver? We would find, we would sign that is a legit upgrade. I was looking at these lists the other day, these free agent lists. Let's check the wide receivers. Um, It's not a sexy free agent receiver class as it stands right now. I mean, you have a guy like Calvin Ridley with the Jaguars. You kind of had a disappointing year after having a a promising start. Um, you know, it's it's not a jam-packed, exciting class, though. I mean, some of the names, um, you know, the guys who are either voiding or free agent, like Mike Evans, if he were to somehow be gone from Tampa, but uh, why would they do that? Um, you know, Tyler Boyd from the Bengals, but, like, that's your, you know, Darius Slayton right there. Uh, Kendrick Bourne with the Patriots, 29 years old. Don't hate him as a player, you know, but nothing, nothing that jumps out to me as like an obvious, I mean, Nelson Aguilar is a guy who's like a veteran. I know he's had some drops throughout the years, but he has some playoff pedigree and um, has made some big plays in big spots, but you know, uh, you know, Higgins and Pittman, like you brought up those names. Those are the big names. Um, I'm a fan says Bo Nix is most pro ready quarterback. Yeah, people also think he's like good but not great. That's like a lot of what a lot of people tell me. Like he's good but not great. So does that fix your quarterback problem if you draft him? If you draft him. Chris says, Good afternoon. Checking in. Sorry, I'm late. All good, Chris. This will be once I once I stop this chat, um, we will it'll be loaded on the page for you to go back and watch in the rewind. So don't worry about that. Thanks for jumping in at all, man. Really appreciate it. Chris, if you, I think you were here last time, but off-season schedule, unless I tell you certain weeks it's going to change because something crazy is happening, but off-season schedule is going to be Mondays at noon, Thursdays at 9 p.m., um, and then, you know, along with my podcasts and other things that will be on the page. Let's see. Let's see. 49ers window is now to win with Brock practically free for the next two years. Says Hunter, that's right. Doug says, I really enjoyed your story on Isaiah Adams and Rosengarten. Linking names to the Giants early on is fun to keep track of as we get closer. Would love more of a keep an eye on X player. I will get into more of that, Doug. And I tried to take that opportunity at the Senior Bowl to do a little bit of that. One thing I want to do at the Combine is to really get in the weeds on the quarterbacks with stuff like that as well and bring you all that information. Uh, But certainly, like I said, Marshawn Lloyd from USC at running back. Watch him. 
Uh, Taste Bud says Jay Harbaugh hired as Hawks special teams coach. Thoughts on that? That would be John's son who had a stint at Michigan, and I believe a little with Ravens. So McDonald has some history with him. That's right. There's that connection. Super Unknown says, what about Spencer Rattler as a pick for the Giants? Um, Rattler is super small and undersized, uh, does not profile to what the Giants typically like. So I know Joe Shane has shown that he's willing to draft some smaller players. So I guess maybe that's a wild card there, but um, Rattler's really built more like a Baker, Baker Mayfield. I was surprised at how small he was when I saw him at the Senior Bowl. He obviously had a really good Senior Bowl. Um, so not saying he's not a good player, but doesn't profile to me as the type of guy the Giants would draft. Why does there seem to be no interest in Wink Martindale by other teams, says Matthew? I think there has been. Um, I think that, you know, the Giants have put out um, and there's been a lot of information painting Martindale and the Wilkins brothers as bad guys in this situation. And I think the NFL is a cover your ass league. And I think people in, and this doesn't, this isn't just about Martindale. This is about a lot of coaches out there who aren't getting opportunities when others are. I see a lot in this coaching cycle of people hiring the safe non-threat in their opinion or in their mind, rather than hiring the best candidate, even guys who aren't getting interviews for head coaches or whatever it is. And I'm not even talking about Martindale. I'm just talking about in general in the, um, in the NFL, like the hiring cycle is broken. I mean, almost none of the head coaching hires this year did anything for me at all, um, you know, compared to other names out there. But I do think that what happened at the end in New York has had a negative effect on a lot of people associated with it. And of course, blame publicly has been pushed by certain parties, you know, coming from the Giants way, it feels like onto people who have left them. But um, I think obviously people who are doing their research and people around the league know what is what, um, you know, I think the one remaining open defensive coordinator position is in Dallas. That'll be interesting, um, to see how that goes. I think I've seen Ron Rivera's name attached to that. Mike Zimmer's name attached to that. Um, you know, who knows where that goes. Um, but that's my take on that situation. And then Hunter says, what do you think the Bucks should pay Baker Mayfield, Daniel Jones type money? Whew. That's a great question. That's a great man. Hunter, that's the hardest question of this chat. That's a really good one. Um, I would, I would not. Um, I guess you have to, I guess you have to reward him for the type of play that he just turned in. I mean, you're changing your offensive coordinator. Um, can you bank on him having the same kind of success? They weren't elite by any means. They were, they were good enough and exceeded expectations. So I think you're paying Baker Mayfield more than what he's been making, but I don't think you're paying him Daniel Jones money either, because I think you need to see more. That would be my take on that. Joey B says, who do you think our best choice for defensive coordinator is at this point? Um, I guess at this point, for all intents and purposes, if you can get Brendan Daly to leave the Chiefs and bring him on, at least you can say we waited until the Super Bowl was over and hired a guy that we were really high on and he's got pedigree from Kansas City. Um, you know, and he knows Mike Kafka, right. And like those things, it probably tie all those things together. So again, it's probably the strongest public relations move, um, you know, on the coaching side, but as far as the coach they would hire, um, you know, interesting, interesting question. Um, I, you know, I, I'd love to see Jerome get a shot, but again, I don't think he's been prioritized in the search, obviously. Um, Joey B says, Pat, are you going to get the Travis Kelsey cut now that it's a trend? <laughs> no, no, I'm not, I'm not anti, uh, not anti Kelsey Swift, whatever. Um, it is quite the spectacle, but it'll be something else next year. You know, Hunter says, say Zimmer or Ron doesn't get the Dallas job. Could we get one of them or are they going to stay away as veteran coaches? 
I guess I could see Ron Rivera wanting a job and uh, that being a thing. Um, I guess that's, I guess that's possible, but I um, haven't heard anything yet on that. Not sure Zimmer makes sense. Although it seems less likely now, but if Kafka leaves, would you see the in New York says Chris? Uh, I think Shea Tierney would get promoted if Kafka were gone. And frankly, that's, you know, Gable probably would like to promote Tierney there anyway. Tierney like is profiling like he's ready for that step somewhere. He's interviewed for places at OC. Seems like a guy who, you know, he was just OC at the uh at the senior bowl. Um, I think it would probably be Shea. Um, let's see. And Super Unknown says, How come Eric Mangini never got a shot again? Always thought he would be a good coach for the Giants. Uh just can't just became radioactive, I think, with a reputation for, um, you know, there was obviously the spy gate with him versus Belichick and him kind of burning some bridges behind him as he um, kind of burning some bridges behind him as he was trying to make a case for himself. And, um, you know, burning bridges rarely works. That's what I would say. Yeah. Hunter says he's shocked. The enemy doesn't have a job. Um, I'm not as high on the enemy as an actual coach as other people are, but uh, definitely some weirdness there with what the Raiders and Kingsbury and bringing him in and then the enemy still on the, um, he's still listed as their offensive coordinator, but Kingsbury has been hired as their OC. I mean, weird stuff. Washington still just can't get out of its own way. You know, their new ownership supposed to bring a new day. We will see. But guys, speaking of a new day, I mean, this community just keeps building. And you guys are making it happen. And I really appreciate you spending the time. Um, you know, I was I, in judging what times we are doing these live chats. I was actually looking a lot at the analytics of um, of when followers and people who are fo- who follow my page and subscribe and watch are most often on YouTube. And uh, it suggested to me that midday early in the week is one of them like middle you know lunchtime like monday tuesday and then evening kind of like wednesday thursdays are good as well and so that was part of my decision along with my schedule in order to create that schedule if you think there's better times um that that work better for you or that that people people are more often on let me know but i get a sense that In the morning, people are starting their days, going to work, doing their jobs, getting stuff done. And, you know, around dinner time, you're picking people up, you're, you know, you're, you know, you're in transit, you're doing a lot of things, you're you're not be able to just sit there. So I do think that um, those times will work out for us. And then I can always supplement and add emergency ones or new ones as we go. That's right. Pat analytics. That's right, Doug. (laughs) Joey B says, hour and a half, I'll be listening by Mondays at work. My man. Guys, thank you so much. Remember, we are sponsored by Bet Online and Estate 98 um, Coffee. It's an Essencia uh, Day Cafe from El Salvador. It dates back to 1798. It takes two seconds to make, make an iced coffee. I drink it all the time when I'm doing talking ball. Here it is right here in the cup. And, uh, you know, remember, uh, we are on TikTok, Instagram, YouTube. New York Daily News website, talking about Pat Leonard with the Believe Network. Want to give a shout out again to everybody who dropped super chats and super stickers in. Joel, Jim, uh, Thor, CGF Sports, you guys are the best. And everyone, Hunter and everybody else, Joey B, who supported today and su- supports me all the time on this. Uh, Joey B says 9 p.m. is great for Mondays and Thursdays. Okay, so the nighttime, you do like how that works out as well. All right, so maybe I'll consider that as like a time for the bonuses as well. Like maybe if we do a bonus one, maybe it ends up being like a, a Monday or Tuesday night at 9 p.m. if it's a bonus third one in a week. Um, so that sounds good. But thank you so much, guys. It's been great. We've basically gone for an hour and a half here. Wow. What a community. What a time here on the Talking Ball Live Q&A. You guys are the best. See you next time.